Hi, everyone. My name is Joe Kelly. I am the program host for the Community Relations Department at Rochester Hills Public Library. Uh, we would like to welcome you to this evening's program, Beware of Colon Cancer, with Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital's Dr. Michael Hennion and Stephanie Bauer from the hospital's Community Health and Education Department. Uh, please join us on Thursday, March 11th at 7 p.m. for a Smart Towns program, The Silver Lining in the Midst of a Pandemic, also with Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. Uh, for more about Smart Towns, visit smarttowns.rhpl.org. And to register for the program, uh, you can visit our website at rhpl.org, or you can go to calendar.rhpl.org. Uh, we will leave times for questions at the end of the, tonight's presentation. Uh, you will uh, guests will remain muted throughout, but you can feel free to ask questions in the chat. Uh, Stephanie often will be moderating questions towards the end, so feel free to ask questions, and then at the end, we'll, we'll go through those after the presentation. Um, and uh, this program tonight will be recorded. It'll also be uh, available to watch on our YouTube uh, page uh, in about one week from today. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank the Friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library for helping to financially support our programs. And with all of that said, I would like to pass it off to uh, my wonderful partner uh, at Ascension Health, uh, Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital, Stephanie Bauer. Please take it away. Hi, everybody. That is a long title. So we all have to get used to Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. But. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for coming this evening. I am, like Joe said, a nurse coordinator for the Community Health and Education Department at Ascension Providence Rochester Hospital. So thank you so much. Um, we do Ascension Health Talks quarterly with the, with the library. So we're really glad to have Dr. Hanin with us today. Um, I wanted to focus a little bit on colorectal cancer because this is March's Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. And tonight's presentation is meant to shine a light on this very important topic. Um, colorectal cancer is one of the most preventable of all cancers. And yet many of you know somebody who's either suffered from or even died from this, this type of cancer. So our hope is that you can learn more and be more aware of colon cancer. Um, so thank you so much for Joe and the Rochester Hills Public Library for hosting tonight. Um, reminder that that Zoom chat feature is for you to use, ask questions. I will gather those questions up and present those to Dr. Hanin at the end of the presentation. So definitely we, we want and encourage you to ask questions. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Hanin. He is an MD and an MBA. He's a board certified in general surgery and board certified in colon and rectal surgery and he's been in practice for 23 years. So let's welcome Dr. Hanin. Thank you very much um, uh, for that kind introduction. And uh, why don't we just get started? So I'm gonna try and share my screen and let's see if that works. Can you guys uh, see that? Looking clear on uh, my end. All right. Um, so be aware of colon cancers, uh, my topic was a little less dramatically titled. It's preventing and finding colorectal cancer, um, especially because it's colorectal cancer awareness month. That's why I thought it was important. Okay. There we go. So first thing is why is colorectal cancer screening very important? Colorectal cancer is the number two cause of cancer death in the United States and it affects both men and women. Um, among men, it's actually number three behind prostate cancer and lung cancer. And in women, it's actually number three behind breast cancer and lung cancer. But when you, when you add it all together, it's actually the second leading cause of cancer death in the United States. It's also one of the most easily preventable col uh, cancers that we have. Um, it is more preventable than breast or prostate cancer. Uh, especially by doing what we're going to talk about, which is colonoscopies. Uh, the risk increases as people get older. And most of the time when people develop symptoms, they have late stage uh, colon cancer and not earlier stage. A lot of times people will ask, what is the colon and what's the difference between the colon and the large bowel or... Uh, the colon is, is also called the large bowel. Um, it, the whole thing is called the colon. We, we divide it into these parts, the cecum, the ascending going up, transverse across, descending down, 
sigmoid because somebody thinks it looks like an S. And then the last part is the rectum. But it's all called the colon, all of it's called the colon or also called the large bowel. In a colonoscopy, we actually view the entire colon um, all the way to the beginning here, which is called the cecum. Most colorectal cancers start in polyps, 90% of them do. A polyp is a growth coming from the inner lining of the colon. The colon is made up of multiple layers, both glands and muscles, but the innermost layer uh, is where polyps will start. They usually are benign, meaning they haven't turned into cancer. Um, and those polyps will continue to grow over time and will eventually, or can eventually, uh, invade further into the colon and become cancer. Uh, lots of people will have polyps that don't turn into cancer, but almost all cancers will start from polyps. And here's the key. Polyps can be removed during colonoscopy. And by removing polyps, you can actually reduce the risk of the patient getting colon cancer. Polyps come in different shapes. So if you look on the top right here, I'm sorry, the top left, uh, this is a relatively big polyp, but it's called a sessile polyp because there is, it's very close to the normal wall of the bowel or of the colon. Um, so this is a sessile polyp. This is another sessile polyp. If you notice, the, it's kind of just like a big lump or wart that's growing straight out of the bowel wall. Then over here on the top right, this is called a pedunculated polyp. It's got a little stalk, almost like a mushroom, and this stalk is usually normal tissue. And then uh, lastly, the polyps can come in flat formations. So down here on the bottom, bottom right, this is a polyp, it's abnormal glands, but it's very flat. Uh, these can be difficult to see, but they are also um, removable. So, like we were talking about, colonoscopy is a very powerful cancer prevention tool. Colonoscopy is the only procedure or the only screening test that allows both identification and removal of polyps, i.e. prevention of cancer. So a lot of people will talk about, uh, you know, mammograms, for example, or x-rays or low-dose CT scans to detect uh, breast cancer or lung cancer. Um, those tests are very good at detecting a cancer, but once it's detected, it has to be treated. The amazing thing about colonoscopies is by removing the polyp, you can actually prevent the cancer. Uh, and that what's, is what makes uh, colonoscopy screening different from all the other cancer screenings out there. Excuse me. So, what we, when we remove a polyp, we call it a polypectomy. So here's a polyp. Um, it's a sessile polyp kind of stuck to the bowel wall. Sometimes we can put a snare, which is like a, a lasso around it. Sometimes we need to inject to lift it, lift the upper layer from the deeper layers and then put the snare around it. Here's where it was then removed. And the, the wire snare, we can heat it up so it, it also stops bleeding. And then if you look carefully, this spot here on the bottom left picture can be seen in the distance on the bottom right picture. And this is the polyp that's free to be recovered and then sent to the lab for evaluation by the pathologist. Um, so it's a biopsy. However, as long as there's no cancer here, we could have easily prevented cancer from forming in this patient. Understanding who's at risk for colon cancer. We all are at risk for colon cancer. Colon cancer or colorectal cancer affects both men and women. Over their lifetime, each person has a risk of about one in 20, 5%. 
It's most common after the age of 50, but it can strike at younger ages. Um, and it's, we're actually starting to notice that people are starting to get this uh, disease younger and younger. Everyone is at risk, and the most important factor risk is age. Other things that increase your risk. If somebody else in your family has colon cancer, you have an increased risk of colon cancer. If somebody else in your family has colon polyps, you're at increased risk of colon polyps. Cigarette smoking, obesity, physical uh, inactivity, abdominal radiation, um, early, uh, early cancer of the uterus or ovaries, um, especially before the age of 50, can indicate uh, what's called Lynch syndrome, which puts you at risk for colon cancer, having ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And African-Americans are at higher risk of colon cancer uh, than non-African-Americans. The symptoms uh, of colorectal cancer. Oh, sorry, I jumped to one too many. Most early colorectal cancers do not produce any symptoms. This is why screening is, is so important. By the time people develop symptoms, they usually have a cancer that's been there for quite a while and is relatively advanced. Uh, and compared to early stage cancers, it's harder to cure um, and harder to treat. However, some of the more, more possible, some of the possible symptoms that should get you, get you to your doctor to be checked include a new onset of abdominal pain, blood in stool or change in the stool shape. People will commonly say, uh, you know, I used to have normal sized stool, but now my stools are thin like a pencil. Um, change in your bowel habits, you know, more cramps or you'll go to the bathroom more often, smaller amounts or unexplained weight loss. Any of those symptoms, uh, you should go to your doctor and uh, make sure you get checked for colon cancer. This is the biggest thing. Do not wait until you have a symptom or you think you may have a symptom to get checked for colon cancer. Half of those who are diagnosed after symptoms develop will die of the cancer. That's why screening is that important. Screening uh, for colorectal cancer. The most common or the most effective form of screening is colonoscopy, and especially in average risk individuals. Average risk is someone who doesn't have one of the previously mentioned increased risk factors. Um, a colonoscopy every 10 years is the preferred colorectal cancer screening method. It, it does the best job of finding polyps and can prevent the cancer. For normal risk individuals, uh, it's every 10 years starting at the age of 50. African Americans, however, should start earlier and that's because we're finding out that African Americans are diagnosed at a later stage with more advanced cancers and tend to not do as well um, at the, when they're diagnosed at the same age. Um, I mean, a perfect example is Chadwick Boseman. He, uh, even though he was making all these great Marvel movies, he was 43 when he passed away from colon cancer and was being treated for almost four or five years while he was making all the movies we love for the colon cancer. So it's definitely important that African-Americans start their screening early. Uh, I kind of just said all this. They're diagnosed with colorectal cancer at a younger age than any other group. They have decreased survival and uh, don't do as well when they're diagnosed later. There's lots of controversy about the different screening options. Let me stop here for a second and clarify something that I'm not sure I put in the slides. A screening test is doing a colonoscopy or doing a test based on the chance that a person has the disease. 
It's not in a person that has symptoms or has any indications that they have the disease. It's almost based on, in fact, it is based on statistics. So the risk of colon cancer starts to rise at, at the age of 50. So that's why we set it at the age of 50. There are other kinds of colonoscopies. We call them uh, surveillance or therapeutic or diagnostic. Uh, that's, that, those are kind of arbitrary, observa or ob ob arbitrary names, but I'm specifically focused on screening colonoscopy in, our, in this presentation. So screening for colon cancer can be done uh, six different ways. Colonoscopy is the preferred method. That's where the scope looks at the entire colon. You can do a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is a shorter version of the colonoscopy. People love to talk about virtual colonoscopy or CT colonography. There's Cologuard, uh, which is a fit DNA test. Um, there's, and I'll, I'll define this in a minute. There's the, then there's the straight stool tests, which are the Sensa and the Guaya. A colonoscopy is where you put the camera in and, and look at the entire colon. It does require a bowel preparation. This is the part of the test that people tend to dislike. Uh, you have to drink a bunch of stuff and it gives you a pretty impressive diarrhea, um, but that's the way the clean out works. It's usually done the day before the test. The colonoscopy is done with sedation. It's done in a hospital or an endoscopy center, and it's in and out, uh, you know, outpatient procedure. It's the best test for seeing and removing polyps, and it's the only one that allows them to be removed at the same time. If we find a polyp and remove it, then we need to do what's called surveillance, and that is usually a repeat colonoscopy in anywhere between three to five years sometimes earlier. If the test is completely normal, then we repeat the colonoscopy every 10 years until the person is not healthy enough to take the test or we usually stop at the age of 85. A flexible sigmoidoscopy uses the same type of scope, but it doesn't see the whole colon. It requires a bowel preparation it's usually done without sedation and often in the doctor's office. It examines the last part of the bowel. It doesn't examine the entire colon. And that it, it detects about half of the polyps that people may get. It's also very good at seeing polyps. It, it takes advantage. The reason it's used as a screening test, it takes the advantage of the fact that most people will have more than one polyp. So if you find a polyp in the last third of the colon, then you're likely to find one where you didn't look with the sigmoidoscopy and you do a colonoscopy. And then random, you know, in, along the same statistical speak, if you don't find a polyp in the last third, the chance is higher that you won't find a polyp in the other two thirds. Uh, that's why we do a colonoscopy if we find a polyp on sigmoidoscopy. However, if it's completely negative, it's still repeated in five years, you can't go 10 years. Um, and most patients with cancer further up in the colon do not have an adenoma in reach of the sigmoidoscopy, which is why it is, it's not as good of a test. So this is the drawing of the colon we, I showed you before. The sigmoidoscopy goes just in the bottom third. Oftentimes we can get up to about middle of the descending colon, but it doesn't get up much higher than that. Uh, so though it doesn't require sedation, it still requires a bowel prep. And if it's positive, you need another, you need a colonoscopy anyways. CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy um, is an x-ray test. It's done by CAT scan. You do need to take a bowel prep. Then it's in the CAT scan machine, they insert a tube and fill the colon with air. They do two CT scans, one lying on the back and one lying on the stomach. Um, 
they they then use a computer to kind of virtually reconstruct the colon, almost like a 3D model in a computer. And then the radiologist can fly through it and, you know, fly virtually through it and can detect polyps. Um, if they see a polyp, they can't do anything about it. And then you got to go back and reprep and get a colonoscopy. It's a relatively new test that hasn't been, hasn't taken off for large scale screening. So we don't know exactly when the repeat intervals uh, should be. Uh, there has been a widely, uh, a wide range of polyp detection, some being much better, some not as good. Uh, and no, we're not really sure why. And it does require radiation exposure by getting the CAT scan. This is one of the images that are, is used as part of the CT colonography. And if you look right here, this is a pretty big polyp uh, in the colon. So the radiologist would report, hey, there's a big polyp right here. And we would then have to set up a colonoscopy to go figure out what it is or why it's there. There's a fecal test. Uh, and it's a fecal DNA test. They run a, they, a DNA probe on stool that's donated, or I shouldn't say donated, submitted by the patient. Um, and if there's DNA that indicates colon cancer or colon polyps, then it lights up and it's a positive result. If that were to happen, um, you would then need to go get a colonoscopy to look for the uh, look for the reason for the positive test. Uh, trying to be as objective as possible, you know, per the company, they say they detect 92% of polyps and cancers. Um, that's the number they actually put on the TV commercial and uh, they're sponsors of, the, of the, the professional golf, the PGA, and that's the number they're promoting. Now, per competitors, which is basically the societies that promote colonoscopy instead of the DNA test, the, their papers say they detect 50% of cancers and only 15% of large adenomas. The truth is probably somewhere in between. When I've done scopes on patients with uh, positive Cologuard test, I, I almost always find something. Not always, but more than 50% of the time, and way more than 15% of the time. But I have trouble believing the 92%. If the test comes back positive, you have to have a colonoscopy. And if it's negative, you repeat it in uh, three to five years. FIT and fecal occult blood testing are the are the tests that are done usually in the doctor's offices where when they do a rectal exam, they put a little piece of stool on a card and they put a test reagent solution on it. And if the test turned positive, there's evidence of blood. If the test turns negative, it doesn't turn positive. You say, well, there's no blood at the time of testing. It's done annually. If it's positive, you got to go get a colonoscopy. Um, for many years, it was the GUIAC test. Uh, the new one is the fecal immunochemical testing. Uh, the advantage of the, the new one over the GUIAC test is there's lots of things that used to make GUIAC tests falsely positive. But these are office exams. Then we have to talk about who's at increased risk for colon cancer. Increased risk is we talked about this briefly, a first degree relative with colon cancer or colon polyps, a personal history of colon cancer or polyps. In that case, we repeat the colonoscopy at 10 years of age, less than when the cancer in the relative was detected. So if your first degree relative got colon cancer at the age of 50, you do it at the age of 40. But if they got colon cancer at the age of 43, 
you need to start at age 33 and you never go more than five years. So increased or intermediate risk is more than it is uh, 40 years of age or less and every five years. People at high risk are people with genetic cancer syndromes like uh, FAP and HNPCC, familial adenomatous polyposis or um, hereditary non-polyposis colon cancer, people with inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So that's why it's very important to get screened for colon cancer uh, because we can both prevent it and detect it. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So I went ahead and I don't see any questions in the chat yet. So feel free to add those as I start with some questions that I've um, brought with me today. Um, so I've always wondered, Dr. Hainan, um, how often is colon or uh, like a bowel impaction caused by colon cancer? Bowel impaction or uh, colonic obstruction is actually a very late symptom. Okay. So um, it, it doesn't happen very often because most of the time people will have will have other symptoms first. Mm -hmm. However, if it, if they become impacted or you know the colon is fully blocked by by stool, that's a very mm -hmm. late symptom. So it, it's not very common, but it, it's also not a very good sign. Okay. I see you. Um, my, my grandmother ended up having that complication at the end of her life. She was in her 90s. And it was always, I always thought that was probably colon cancer in my mind. You know, she was older, um, had a couple of those issues with bowel impactions and just always thought, hmm, I wonder what that was causing that. But that's actually very likely. Uh, yeah. Again, age is one of the greatest risk factors or increasing age for colon cancer. Sure. So, and I was also wondering, there's a lot of talk about probiotics and how they help our guts. Does this have, help at all prevent colon cancer or colorectal cancer, do you think? I, there is, this has been studied and there's actually no evidence that probiotics will help prevent colon cancer. Okay. In some people, it will help their digestion. It will help, you know, uh, the, stool is, the stool is formed by fermentation by bacteria and the probiotics may, may aid or improve that fermentation so the stool consistency is different and maybe easier. Um, but that's more of a functional improvement and, and it doesn't help with colon cancer. Gotcha, interesting. Um, Mar Margie Cosmo asked, what is a first degree relative? I'm sorry, that's an excellent question because I didn't specify. A first degree relative is either a parent, a sibling or a child. Good to know. Okay. Um, so let's see, I have another question here. Oh, so the guaiac test is testing for blood, right? Hidden blood. What if someone has hemorrhoids and they, you know, they bleed periodically? Is that, is that one of those false negatives? And, and would that be an appropriate test for somebody with hemorrhoids? Um, so it's usually, so it's called an occult blood, meaning blood that's not clearly visible. Right. So if your hemorrhoids are bleeding, that's visible blood. Right. No one should be testing for it. Gotcha. Um, but it would turn the test positive if right. you had a little bit of bleeding. Um, and the way I would look at it is that test is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But I put it at the end of the presentation because it's the least, in my opinion, the least preferable. I gotcha. So... Um, if you're sure you're not going to get a colonoscopy or in another test, then this is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's by far the least preferable and least effective. Gotcha. Now, what about, my, I was just curious, since polyps start as non-cancerous, what is, what causes that? Is there any, I mean, direct cause of what, because so, you know, some people have polyps and again, they're not cancerous, but what's causing the polyps to form? So there's a series of four genetic changes that start 
that take a regular cell in the colon all the way to colon cancer. Okay. And that process on average takes about 10 years. But those four genetic mutations, they start by making the lining of the colon grow abnormally or more aggressively. Okay. And by the fourth genetic mutation, it actually invades the, it's called the submucosa. Sure. Um, it actually invades into the wall of the colon. The only difference between what's called an adenoma, which is an abnormal glandular growth, and a colon cancer or a carcinoma is if it has been able to chew through that basement membrane. So that's when we send it to the pathologist to look under the microscope. That's how they tell this is just a polyp versus that's a colon cancer is they look for that basement membrane and they see if any of the cells have, have eaten through it. So polyp, again, polyps start with the first few uh, genetic mutations mm -hmm. in the cell and then continue, and then they become colon cancer as the other mutations happen. Gotcha. So eating fiber, eating fruits and vegetables can help prevent the formation of polyps, right? It can help that, and we're not actually sure why, but it also prevents lots of other troubles, such as um, diverticular disease and hemorrhoids. Okay. So Jennifer says, does that mean that any and all polyps can or will turn into cancer? No. So if a polyp has the first two or three genetic mutations, it may just stay a polyp and it may grow surprisingly big. Um, it needs to get all four of those mutations to become cancer. So lots of people have polyps, about one third of the population. Mm -hmm. um, and most polyps don't become colon cancer because they don't acquire all four of the, the, the genetic mutations. But 90% of colon cancers come from polyps. So if you find 1,000 people, ten, um, it, you know, if you get 1,000 people, 100 of them will get colon cancer. Or 1,000 polyps, 100 of them, 100, 1,000 of those people with polyps, 100 of them will have the polyp turn into cancer. Okay. So it's just a risk that, you know, if you have a polyp, you're at risk ultimately. Correct. It's actually a statistical risk. Statistical risk. All right. Karen mentions that her father had colon cancer and lived a very high risk lifestyle. Like a smoke, he was a smoker, high fat diet, intense job stress, et cetera. And that she lives a totally opposite lifestyle. She doesn't smoke. She eats healthy. She exercises regularly and she has limited stress. Do genetics outweigh lifestyle in her case? Yes. So she should have a colonoscopy 10 years earlier than it was found in her father. Gotcha. And she should never go more than five years without a colonoscopy. Okay. So it looks like we have another question about, do you have any advice to ease the anxiety of people being nervous about getting a colonoscopy or other screening procedures beforehand? Well, it depends on what you're nervous about. If if you're nervous that something that they're going to find something bad, the earlier you get your colonoscopy, the less likely it's going to be something bad. Uh, even if we find a colon cancer at the age of 50, we often can treat it and cure it almost 90%. So we can cure 90% of stage one colon cancers. Um, if you're nervous about the procedure, the part of the test that people hate is the prep. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's actually three parts. The first part is the prep the day before. I don't have any good advice for that. It's mm -hmm. I've had to do it myself twice and it, it, it just, it's something you got to do. Right. Um, some people are afraid of injury during the test, which can happen. That chance of serious injury is about one in 5,000 or even less than that. And some people just don't like the idea of, you know, there's a small number that don't like the idea of being anesthetized and out of control. Mm -hmm. I don't have great advice for that either. It's just, it's something you kind of got to get over. Mm -hmm. 
And may, would you recommend for someone who is really, really struggling with that, that they do the Cola Guard just in case? I mean, or is that not, would you not go as far as to say that? So in, in my opinion and generally accepted, colonoscopy is the best test. Right. But if you're not going to do it, do, do something else. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it, it, it's like, uh, I don't have a really good analogy, but, you know, colonoscopy is the best, but if you don't want it, then try and go with the other ones. Just understand, if you do a cola guard and it comes back positive, the first thing your doctor is going to say to you is, you got to get a colonoscopy. Right. Do they ever do colonoscopies without being put under? Is that so it's very very rare okay. um it can be done and i i have seen it done a few times but we generally do them with conscious sedation the other thing you got to understand is colonoscopy the sedate it's actually called conscious sedation right um though you may not remember anything the person's actually kind of awake they can tell you if there's something going wrong they can tell you if they're having pain uh the anesthesia people don't have to take control of the breathing so for regular surgery we take control of breathing and everything mm -hmm. for conscious sedation um we don't take control of their breathing we don't con take control of their heart rate we or their heart we just you know it, it's just a really uh, I hate to say it this way, but it, it's just a really good buzz. People just kind of, or though I've never done it, thank God, uh, it's like an alcoholic blackout. You just, you take something you don't remember, then you remember, but it only lasts about half an hour. Gotcha. Okay. So it, it's much less dan you know, dangerous than what we call general anesthesia. Right. And you're obviously being monitored during that time as well. So yeah, so you have a professional anesthesia person monitoring you. Right. Okay. And it's my understanding that a colonoscopy is, so is, can be covered by insurance because it's a preventative. If it's, you know, is that kind of usually how it goes? A screening? Yes. There's a whole, but there's a whole lot of controversy there. So, yeah. um, Insurance companies will cover screening colonoscopies as long as you haven't had one in an X number of years. Mm -hmm. The trick that they, and this bothers me, it makes me mad, but the trick they'll pull is if I start a colonoscopy and say I'm screening the person because they're 50 years old and they've never had one, if I find a polyp and remove it, the insurance company will change it and say, well, now it was a therapeutic or a diagnostic colonoscopy oh. and they'll try and get your copay and deductible out of you. Oh. So we actually have to warn patients that sometimes, you know, we'll call it screening and that's the purpose that we started it, but it may change and the insurance company may come out, you know, may try and get you to pay a copay and deductible. Wow. So Jennifer has another polyp question. Um, basically, it's if you remove that polyp, are you removing the risk for cancer from that polyp? Is yes. That okay. Exactly. So the way we know this, it's kind of a, a little bit of an abstract or esoteric uh, piece of information. Many years ago, they wanted to find out which percentage of the colon had more polyps. So they did something called the National Polyp Study. And they did colonoscopies and they documented where they found polyps and how, how big they are. Mm -hmm. Years later, they went back to the same group of patients and looked at their risk of getting colon cancer. How many of them gotten colon cancer? And they had a 90% lo lower chance of getting colon cancer than people that hadn't participated in the national polyp study. Yeah. And that's how we know we prevent colon cancer by removing polyps. Gotcha. Very good. Very strong evidence there. Wow. Yeah. Well, I don't think any more questions from the audience. Oh, wait, maybe one just came up. So, okay. So what happens to the area where the polyp was removed? Is it left to heal or is it cauterized? And I, I think I know the answer, but go ahead with that one. 
So we use uh, cautery to prevent bleeding. Right. But the colon is made up of multiple layers and we usually will only work on removing anything in the first layer. So it's like a cut in the skin. It will heal up on its own. So it's left to heal. Okay. But oftentimes it heals to a point that's undetectable. So if I remove a polyp and three years later I go back and look, off, unless I know where it was, I oftentimes can't see a scar. Can't see a scar. So is it painful after, like once you're not, you're at home, after you've had a colonoscopy, um, maybe some polyps removed, is that painful to the patient? Not, not at all. Okay. It, it, you don't notice the difference. Wow, that's, in, that's it, something. Okay, good to know too. Um, Oh, this is my son. Sorry about that, you guys. Um, so, <laughs> so do you, can you recommend like how much fiber we should be consuming in a in a day? Um, is there any new recommendations on that? So, so the recommendations are at least thirty grams of fiber a day. There's two kinds of fiber. They're soluble and insoluble. Soluble right. generally comes from fruits. Um, insolubles from vegetables and grains. Uh, as long as you get a good mix of both and, and about 30 grams a day, you should do, everything should be very good. Okay, good. Um, then there was another question I had here. Let's see, make sure nobody else. Um, oh, is there, you know, we talk about colon cancer, but I've always been curious what about like, intestinal cancer, like small intestinal cancer. Is that something that we need to be worried about or? Small bowel cancer, small intestinal cancer is extremely rare, okay. which is why we really don't, we don't have a screening test for it. And we, there isn't really a need to develop one. Okay. So cancer tends to form on either the colon side or the stomach side, which gotcha. is the upper track or the lower track. And the middle is kind of free of, of cancer in most cases. Okay. That's good. To, that's a relief for sure. Um, someone, someone asked about um, how do you measure the fiber you're eating if you're eating fresh fruits and veggies? Because that's really not on their package. I mean, is there any recommendation when you're from you? Um, that's a hard one. I mean, I, there's charts and tables all over the sure. internet that tell you a, a medium apple has this. Right. So, you know, this kind of apple versus that kind of apple. I can you tell you. You have to do your own research. You have to do your own research. Yeah. I have a couple rules of thumb that are ge general. So if anyone decides to look up details, you'll find errors. But in general, the fruits that people like have lower soluble fiber. So, um, uh, you know, bananas. Uh, oranges, grapes, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Apples have a wide variety, but they I put them kind of in the middle. And then mm -hmm. the ones that have higher fiber are, I call them the three peas and all the berries. Okay. Peaches, pears, plums, blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries. Gotcha. Those are all on the higher fiber of the spectrum for fruit. Right. We think of the prune, right? That's prunes too. <laughs> well, right, that's a, a dried I plum, right? Four peas now. Right, right. <laughs> um, I'm surprised. I feel like there's fiber in, in raisins, but not grapes. So that's just interesting. It's funny. I'm not, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's all right. That's all right. Uh, oh, so they want to know what the three P's are again. Well, I'm going to call them four P's now. Okay. <laughs> peaches, pears, and plums. And then prunes we added, right? Prunes, yep. Right, which is a dried plum. So, yeah. okay. Oh, very good. All right. Well, this was very informative, Dr. Well, Hanin. Thank, thank you so much. This is great. I, I don't think there's any more questions from the group. Do you have anything else, Joe? Uh, no, I don't have any questions or anything. Uh, I do want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. I also want to thank Stephanie, uh, as always, for coming out. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Hanin as well. This is a really informative uh, uh, program. It's definitely advice I think pretty much everybody should know. So thank you very much for giving us that advice. And thank you all for joining us. We hope you'll come back and see me and I believe Stephanie next week as well uh, for the Silver Linings.
presentation, uh, Silver Linings Amidst the Pandemic. Yes, we'd love you to join for that one. That's a heartwarming one. We're looking forward to that as well. And just so you know, I'll be sending everybody a feedback form. So I hope you can fill that out. And we're going to record this, right? We've recorded this tonight. So yep. this will be available um, on the YouTube page at the library as That's well in a week or so. Today. So same night as that presentation. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Everybody stay safe. Thanks. And thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Hanin. No problem. All right, bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.